Okay, folks, I'm finally live. It gave me a bit of a problem today. I don't know why, but um, welcome everybody who's watching on live stream and also all of you on Zoom. I'm sure glad to see you here today. Don't forget to invite more people to our uh, Zoom Bible studies on Wednesdays and Thursdays in particular. Uh, also be aware that I'm posting all of my Bible studies on the ACT TV YouTube site as well as RTN. And they're also available as the live stream on Moriel TV on YouTube. <clears throat> well, um, let's get started with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to get together today and to study your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would... Uh, add these things to our lives through your, your Holy Spirit so that we, we might truly exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in our lives so that people would be would see the Lord working in our lives and would want to give their lives to you. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you have left us your word so that we can understand what you want and what you're like. Pray you be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, uh, we are at the last uh, fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians 5, which is self-control. Interestingly, it's um, I would say it's a very effective way to discern whether a church is actually a scriptural church or not. Churches that just get out of control, especially with slaying in the spirit and all that, are not exhibiting the spirit, the, uh, the fruit of the spirit of self-control. You will find that the, a true church is going to be self-controlled. They're not gonna let things get out of hand. Well, there are a number of good examples in the Bible of people who had self-control. One of those was Daniel. Uh, he was a man who was self-controlled, and he had many opportunities to act maybe in a disorderly or an impatient way, but he always showed self-control. Now, when he was a young man, he, he could have eaten like a glutton on the king's food. You know, I'm sure it was a temptation since they had been you know dragged over there to, to Babylon from Israel but you know what he was self-controlled and chose to follow the law of Moses and because of his stand for what he believed in and his friends <clears throat> were put into service to the king himself people actually respected them Daniel 1 19 through 20 says that the king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. When Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel to interpret his dreams, Daniel never took personal credit for the interpretations but always gave the full glory to God. Daniel 2, 27 through 28, Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Later in the kingdom of Darius, the Administrators and satraps devised a plot to have Daniel killed by having Darius sign a law that prevented anyone from praying to any other god or man except to him for 30 days. Daniel could have become angry and gone to the king, but instead he continued his daily prayers for Israel. Daniel 6, 10 through 11. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went to his home, to his upstairs room, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. 
Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. Well, of course, we all know how God delivered Daniel from the lion's den. God delivered Daniel because he was a faithful servant. And to show that he alone was the one true God to the rulers of Persia. Because of Daniel's self-control in the face of impossible circumstances, death, and lions, God did miraculous things through him. Well, you know what? The Bible teaches us about self-control throughout. Those who follow the Lord are known as people who have self-control. Proverbs 25, 20, 28 says, like a city whose walls are broken down as a man who lacks self-control. Anything get in, can get in. Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. One of the things that rushes in so fast is anger. We all know that. We all experience that to one degree or another. That kind of teaching continues in the New Testament Gentile church. Christians were to control their fleshly lusts. First Thessalonians 4.4, 4, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that's holy and honorable. Titus 2.12 says it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. There's nothing more significant and, and noteworthy than a person who is self-controlled among a generation who is not. Leaders in the church were to be, to be men of self-control. 1 Timothy 3, 2 through 3 says, Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but, but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Well, the qualities of the true believer included self-control. Second Peter 1, 5 through 8, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. But if you possess these qualities in, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be effective, not unproductive. Self-control is God's method to keep us alert to deception. By the way, there are some other fruit of the Spirit that aren't mentioned in Galatians 5. One of those would be discernment. Another one might be forgiveness. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. So then let us not be like others who will sleep but let us be alert and self-controlled. Those two things go hand in hand, not just being alert, but also being self-controlled. First Peter 5, 8, but be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I've noticed that a lot of people during a pandemic or something that's something bad that's happening they have the, uh, they're alert to what's going on but they don't have self-control they just get all uptight about it well you know self-control prepares us for action for witness in particular first peter 1 13 therefore prepare your minds for action be self-controlled set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. 
Self-control allows us to be ready for the return of Christ and to be able to pray with a clear head. You know, in a moment, we're going to read verses that totally destroy the false doctrine taught in many churches today, that you must uh, quit praying to receive the Holy Spirit. You ever heard that one? I heard it quite a bit during the Brownsville thing. You know, the Holy Spirit teaches us to have a clear mind and have self-control, not to get slain in the spirit, roll around the floor, and make animal noises. That is absolutely not a sign of the Holy Spirit. First Peter 4, 7 says this, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Oh, so you actually have to use your mind and be self-controlled so that you can pray effectively. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the saints. I wish that could be said today. It probably is true when we're talking about true saints, the remnant, but it's certainly not true of the churches anymore. James 3.16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. So we're not to be disorderly. We're not to be like uh, totally self-absorbed to the point where we don't care about other people. But that's unfortunately what our society and modern churches are teaching people. So what are we to do with Christians who are disorderly and not under self-control? Well, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 tells us, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received from us. We have to be careful of people who are walking into chaos and these churches that basically are into totally into chaos we need to get away from them we know that in the last days which we're in now there will be a time without self-control second timothy 3 1 through 5 says but mark this there will be terrible times in the last days people will be lovers of themselves lovers of money boastful proud abusive disobedient to their parents ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. I remember when I first saw all this weird third wave new apostolic latter rain stuff going on in the churches and them claiming that it was the holy spirit but you know i had seen too many things too many evidences of the true working of god as a missionary kid and so i didn't believe it i couldn't believe it and it's you know it's a form of godliness denying the true power people like that will never see the true power of god unless they repent and return to the Lord. So we are to be self-controlled, having nothing to do with those who are not self-controlled. That's because those who practice no self-control tend to infect those that have a desire to live godly lives of self-control. Pretty soon everyone's out of control and God is out of the picture. Well, <clears throat> Let me give you a few stories of self-control. This one was called the marshmallow experiment. The most important thing about emotional self-control is the ability to delay immediate gratification or desires in favor of reaching a goal in the future. The importance of this fact was shown by an experiment begun in the 1960s by psychologist Walter Michel at a preschool on Stanford University campus. Children were told that they could have a single treat, such as a marshmallow, right now. However, if they could wait while the experimenter ran an errand, they could have two marshmallows. 
Some preschoolers grabbed the marshmallow immediately, but others were able to wait for what for them seemed like an endless 20 minutes. It was hard for those who chose to wait. So in their struggle, they covered their eyes so they wouldn't see the temptation, rested their heads on their arms, talked to themselves, sang, and even tried to sleep. When the experimenter returned, they were rewarded with two marshmallows. But the interesting part of this experiment came in the follow-up. The children who as four-year-olds had been able to wait for two marshmallows were, when they were older children, still able to delay immediate gratification or fulfillment of desires in pursuing their goals. They were more able to deal with social life and were more bold and self-assertive and better able to cope with life's frustrations. In contrast, the kids who grabbed the one marshmallow were as older children more likely to be stubborn, unable to make up their minds or indecisive and stressed out. Isn't that something? So that means we should be teaching our kids how to wait for things sometimes. The Bible says we need to wait on the Lord. Unfortunately, though, most people are teaching their children. In fact, our whole world today is being taught through TV, movies, music, books, magazines, that self-control is something that's undesirable. Yeah. The world says that you can be much more free, you have that much more freedom, if you just lose your self-control. Be wild. This has even entered the church, especially with regards to slain in the spirit, where it's being taught that you can only have the Holy Spirit if you lose your self-control. But self-control is actually the very thing that brings freedom. That's what people don't realize today. You know, there's another story called Passion Forge, Passions Forge Their Fetters. British statesman Edmund Burke argued men are able to be free only as they are able to put chains on their own appetites. Hmm. Society cannot exist unless a controlling power, uh, a power upon will and uh, upon will an appetite be placed somewhere, and the less of it there is within people, the more there has to be in society. It's the next eternal principle of things that men who have no self-controlled minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. In other words, their lack of self-control makes the chains that binds them. Oh, is that ever true? Now, I know many of you have been to school, and I suppose you remember having to try to arrange your schedule to get your homework and special projects done, as well as all the other activities. Well, that's where you learned about self-control. You could let everything go to the last second. Some people do that. But if you did, it became much more painful, and you worried about it the whole time until you got it done. One day you decided to get your work done ahead of time and you found out that not only did you have free time on your hands, but you didn't have the worry anymore either. I remember when I discovered that when I was a young man. And ever since then, I always try to get my work done way ahead of time. It's so much easier. Well, self-control also goes over into the area of appetite. And I'm not just talking about appetite for food, but everything in life. If we let our appetites get the best of us, we lose freedom. If we eat too much food, we get fat, and we're not able to do some of the things we used to do when we're slim. There's a story about uh, Lyndon Johnson that goes like this. During his term as president, uh, uh, during, his, during his term as president, um, he, his wife basically told him that, uh, you know what, uh, you need to get control of your appetite. How can you run the, this nation? You know, how can you govern this nation without, uh, by being overweight? 
So his wife challenged him with this brief observation. You can't run the country if you can't run yourself. Respecting Mrs. Johnson's wise observation, the president lost 23 pounds. You know, if we take drugs, we get cooked and get sick. It even goes for small things. If, for instance, women wear too much makeup, people get used to seeing them that way, and they find they can no longer go without it. <laughs> I've heard stories of people who got married <laughs> and they finally saw their wife with no makeup on <laughs> and they got a big shock. <laughs> you know, if young people start buying expensive clothes when they naturally start, and then that, they naturally start hanging out with kids who also buy expensive clothes. The problem is, is that now they've lost their freedom to wear regular clothes, cheap clothes, because they would lose their friends. Well, you know what? That also applies to spiritual things. If we get an appetite for dirty movies where there's sex, filthy language, violence, we soon find ourselves thinking more about those things than about God and his word. Those images color our whole life. And the enemy is able to use them to tempt us to sin. If we get an appetite to listen to and spread gossip about people, pretty soon that gossip turns around and hurts us. We lose our witness and get critical towards other people. And soon our relationship with the Lord suffers. We find that we cannot forgive others. And so how can we expect the Lord to forgive us? That's what the Bible says. I often tell people it's a dangerous thing to pray the what's called the Lord's Prayer. It's really the, the disciples' prayer. Forgive us as we forgive others. <laughs> Are you forgiving others? Self-control is so important in the life of the believer, yet today our society and even the church are not doing very well in that department. Yet it is a fruit of the Spirit. And if we do not have self-control, we're not spirit-controlled, but rather controlled by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I believe this is one of the major battlefields of the enemy in the life of the Christians and in the churches. May we seek to have self-control in our lives, to live them not for self-gratification, but for the glory of God. That's where the rubber hits the, hits the road. That's what we need to be doing. Well, you know, that's uh, that's what I have for you.